When our oldest uh, child, Henry, was in the fifth grade, we got a call from the school principal to let us know about a protest he had led in the lunchroom, <laughs> rallying other students to march and chant for better food and better relationships between the cafeteria staff and the students. As the principal of a progressive school on the Upper West Side of Manhattan, she was careful to say that she fully supported Henry's right to advocate for change and justice. But she wondered if we might want to have a conversation with him, perhaps suggesting that organizing an antagonistic protest needn't be the first move in a movement for change. And there was one more delicate matter. She wanted to apologize for one staff member's behavior. Apparently, the protesting fifth graders had angered the cafeteria workers, understandably, and one of them had referred to our child as a little S-word. <laughs> I think the principal was at first worried that we would want to file a complaint against the employee, but we laughed and let her know that just for the record, he is a little <laughs> S-word, and that we would talk to him about his decision-making. This Lenten season, we're working at peacemaking. And as that fifth grade lunchroom suggests, mobilizing for peaceful change doesn't always produce the results we hoped it would. You'll notice that we're getting a jump start on this Lenten season. Technically, Lent begins this coming week on Ash Wednesday, but you're getting 43 days for the price of 40. So during this season, we're paying attention as best we can to peacemaking as a way of life. We're paying attention to peace and peacemaking as a central theme in Scripture. We're paying attention to the peacemaking possibilities in our own lives. Of course, we undertake this peacemaking journey in the midst of a world marked by hate and cruelty, injustice, violence, and indifference. I don't feel like I need to pile up examples for you. There's no shortage of important issues and causes that we could address in a series on peacemaking, from gun violence to prison reform, from nuclear disarmament to the environmental crisis, from the Taliban's exclusion of girls from education in Afghanistan to police brutality here at home. But we've chosen to focus primarily for this series on peacemaking in our relationships. So over the next several weeks, we're going to do our best to stay close to our ordinary experience with the hope of providing some practical tools, of widening our options, of creating some flexibility and capacity for change, both within ourselves and within the communities that we're all a part of. So a quick sketch of what to expect in this upcoming series. Today, we're just getting started. I'm talking about peacemaking as a way of life, what's at stake and why it matters. Next Sunday will be a Youth Sunday. You'll be in for a treat. We have four of our high school seniors who will be preaching, and they're talking about peacemaking in a Wild West virtual world. So that will be great. On March 5th, I'll continue with that theme of communication, talking about peacemaking forms of communication, both digitally online but also in real life. On the 12th of March... Kristen will be preaching about making peace with ourselves. On the 19th of March, we have a guest preacher, Darren Edwards, pastor of United Believers Community Church, who's done work bridging the gap between police and the community, talking about peacemaking in a communal setting. On the 26th of March, I'll be talking about peacemaking within the family context. Anybody use a little peace in family life? I think it's not just me. And then we'll wind up on Palm Sunday looking at Jesus' life and death as a model for peacemaking. And in that final sermon of the series, we'll raise to the surface a question that lies underneath everything else, which is this, what steps will you take next as a peacemaking follower of Jesus? So with that uh, preview uh, set, I invite you to attend now to our scripture reading for this morning from Matthew's Gospel, from the Beatitudes. Listen now for God's voice to you. <clears throat> Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. You are the salt of the earth. 
But if salt has lost its taste, how can its saltiness be restored? It's no longer good for anything. It gets thrown out and trampled underfoot. You are the light of the world. A city built on a hill cannot be hid. People don't light a lamp and put it under a bushel basket. Rather, they put it on the lampstand, and it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father in heaven. This is the word of the Lord. Jesus announces a blessing on peacemakers. It's not a blessing simply for people with easygoing personalities. It's not a blessing on the conflict avoidant or those afraid of confrontation. This is a blessing on those who devote themselves to a purposeful, peacemaking way of life. So what does that look like? Well, if we keep reading the Gospels, looking at Jesus' teachings and the kinds of stories he tells, the peacemaking way of life builds bridges instead of walls. It forges connections instead of fragmentation. It fosters kindness in the face of hate. It chooses the difficulty of nonviolence, even though violence is always easier. It seeks a more common good in a world of inequity and hoarding. And peacemakers devote themselves to this path, even though they know this way of life will probably get them in trouble. That's why the blessings that follow the blessing on peacemakers involve blessings on those who are targeted, harassed, and called names. Jesus inherits the Jewish tradition's understanding of shalom, peace. And he embodies it in a creative way, inviting others to join him in this new way of being, a new way of communicating and working and relating. It is this surprising, countercultural, troublemaking way of life that will enable all of us as Jesus' followers to be salt and light in the world. We're not salt and light because we belong to a church. We're not salt and light because we believe a list of things that other people don't. We're not salt and light because our lives are any less messy than those of our neighbors. We're not salt and light because we have some special status in God's eyes that other people don't. No, we're salt and light for our family, for our neighbors and our community because we're taking up a peacemaking way of life. Salt preserves and light illumines. So too, Jesus teaches, when we embody Bridge building, reconnecting, reconciliation in a culture that tends to divide and blame. We preserve possibilities for flourishing and we illumine new life-giving possibilities. We titled this Lenten sermon series, Seeking Shalom, in the hopes of rooting our imaginations in the Jewish streams, the Jewish traditions that nourished Jesus' life. In the Hebrew Bible, Shalom names the peace or well-being that can characterize all levels of creation, cosmic, environmental, spiritual, political, socioeconomic, communal, familial, and personal. One of our Presbyterian documents puts it this way, quote, this is the uh, document, Peacemaking the Believer's Calling, peace is more than the absence of war, more than a precarious balance of powers. Peace is the intended order of the world with life abundant for all of God's children. Peacemaking is the calling of the Christian church, for Christ is our peace who has made us one through his body on the cross, end quote. To catch how foundational shalom, peace, and peacemaking are to the Jewish tradition, consider one of the central blessings from the Hebrew Bible. This comes from Numbers 6, still frequently used in both Jewish and Christian liturgies. It goes like this, the Lord bless you and protect you. The Lord make her face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his face to you and grant you shalom, peace. Or again, since we're beginning our Lenten peacemaking journey, consider these sharp, cleansing, and clarifying words from Isaiah 58. God's speaking. They ask me for righteous judgments. They want to be close to God. Why do we fast, Lord, and yet you don't see us? Why do we afflict ourselves and you don't even notice? Yet on your fast day, says God, you do whatever you want. You oppress your workers. You quarrel and brawl, and then you fast. You hit each other violently with your fists. Isn't this the fast I choose? 
releasing wicked constraints, untying the ropes of a yoke, setting free the mistreated and breaking every yoke? Isn't it sharing your bread with the hungry and bringing the homeless poor into your house, covering the naked when you see them and not hiding from your own family and your obligations to them? Then your light will break out like the dawn and you will be healed quickly. Your own righteousness will walk before you and the Lord's glory will be your rear guard. Now look, we're coming into the Lenten season and if you want to give up chocolate or coffee or beer, knock yourself out. Just know that God probably isn't going to give you a trophy for that. Jesus calls each of us and all of us together to summon our very best energy for a new way of life characterized by shalom-seeking, peacemaking. It's not as simple as just being a little nicer or more compassionate and caring. It's not even as clear-cut as becoming more politically aware or finding the courage to confront injustice. This next line might surprise and even disappoint some of you who just lived through our Holy Grail series. So gird your loins. But according to Jesus, this. Peacemaking, this is the Holy Grail. This is it. This repentance, this turning forward into a new peacemaking way of life. This costly letting go of our dreams. Oh, wouldn't we love to have an easier life or a different kind of adventure? To let that go and to take up this new life, this new way of peacemaking. This is the grail. Now, it's true that the stakes are high, but perhaps a note of gentleness would be in order. From today through early April, April we're committing to this shared peacemaking journey, but you get to start that journey from wherever you are, from wherever you find yourself today. There's no wrong place to begin the journey, you should also know that there's no particular destination for this peacemaking journey either. It's rather open-ended, and we've specifically designed this sermon series, yes, to stretch and challenge us as a community, but we've also designed it to acknowledge that our peacemaking journeys will look different depending on our gifts and interests, our stories. My own journey towards peacemaking has been a fairly consistent series of blunders and half-baked ideas. A journey that often feels clumsy and halting, wrong-headed and ill-timed. For me, anger has often fostered much more self-righteousness than bridge building. I've been far too slow in, to direct my energy towards empowering people whose lives aren't characterized by the privileges that I have as a straight, white, able-bodied, middle-class male. It's taken me a painfully long time to begin, to even begin to work free with preoccupation with myself so that I can tend to the well-being of the communities to which I belong. And even the small steps I've been able to take in my own peacemaking journey can only be attributed to the friends I've had who patiently and lovingly helped me grow. During graduate school, I was a member of GISO, which stands for Graduate Employee Student Organization. I was part of that because I knew that graduate students, kind of like adjunct faculty, were serving as cheap labor for a university with an endowment in the billions. Last time I checked, Yale's endowment was 41 billion. But when my colleagues asked me to become a labor organizer, I initially said, no, I, I don't have time. I said no partially because of my professional insecurities. Unlike many of my colleagues, I was from a small, no-name place. I didn't have any family members help me to help me navigate the academic world like some of my colleagues. I had a big case of imposter syndrome. Felt like I didn't belong, so I kept my head down and I worked hard. Was barely staying afloat as a PhD student, at least this is my own brain, this is the stories I'm telling myself. I did manage to find time to play golf. But I told my colleagues I, I couldn't see that I had any time for life as an activist. It wasn't just my professional insecurities that were in play, it was also my religious upbringing. I had been formed in a religious tradition that priorita prioritized the way that persons get right with God, that's what's really important, over any efforts to reform or change systemic issues or to prioritize social, social justice and the good of the community. It's not that I didn't care about political life or economic frameworks or other people. 
It's just that I saw these matters as kind of like icing on the cake of the religious life. These are great things to do if you, if you can get to them, if you have a particular calling. I saw peace and justice matters as the work of some, probably just some small subset of the people of faith. It's kind of a niche calling. It's a way of life for some carve out of the broader community. It's probably a good option for those people with personalities that made activism and social concern a natural fit, sort of an organic thing for them. It was a Jewish colleague of mine in the religious studies department who helped me take the next step in my peacemaking journey. Mark reminded me that we weren't just advocating for better treatment for graduate students and adjunct faculty. We were advocating for an end to university policies of adding more and more part-time jobs, jobs that didn't have benefits, of course. This university labor policy kept many black and brown residents of New Haven from achieving a decent middle-class life. From my Jewish friend, this was the shalom note that I needed to hear. And so finally, and far too late, I said yes to becoming a labor organizer. Now, you will have a different starting point for your peacemaking journey than I did. And the roles and the issues that you take up as God's peacemaking friend need not mirror mine. But we can go on this journey together. We can encourage one another to move deeper in a more exciting, satisfying way into these peacemaking possibilities. I need to shift gears. Can you go with me here? I mean, this is, it's an abrupt segue. Just hang in there. I promise I'll come back. In Stephen Greenblatt's book, The Swerve, How the World Became Modern, won a Pulitzer Prize in 2011, great book, Greenblatt introduces us to a 15th century Italian humanist named Poggio. Great name. We follow Poggio and his Italian humanist friends as they cross Europe in and out of all the oldest monastery libraries hunting for ancient manuscripts. By the time Poggio was sleuthing around in old libraries in the 1450s, Greenblatt writes, Italians had been obsessed with book hunting for the better part of a century ever since the poet and scholar Petrarch brought himself glory around 1330 by piecing together Livy's monumental history of Rome and finding forgotten masterpieces by Cicero and others. Now I'm quoting from Greenblatt, quote, the prime hunting grounds for Poggio and his fellow book hunters were the libraries of old monasteries, and for good reason. For long centuries, monasteries had been virtually the only institutions that cared about books. As the Roman Empire crumbled and cities, as cities decayed, trade declined, and the increasingly anxious populace scanned the horizon for barbarian armies, the whole Roman system of elementary and higher education fell apart. What began as downsizing went on to wholesale abandonment. Schools closed, libraries and academies shut their doors, professional grammarians and teachers of rhetoric found themselves out of work. There were more important things to worry about than the fate of books. Again from Greenblatt, in the course of the vicious Gothic wars of the mid-sixth century and their still more miserable aftermath, the last commercial workshops of book production folded and the vestiges of the book market fell apart. Therefore, almost inadvertently, monastic rules necessitated that monks carefully preserve and copy those books that they already possessed. But all trade with papyrus makers of Egypt had long vanished, and in the absence of a commercial book market, the commercial industry for converting animal skins to writing services had disappeared. Therefore, once again, almost inadvertently, monastic rules necessitated that monks learn the laborious art of making parchment and salvaging existing parchment and in this way, monks became the principal readers, librarians, book preservers, and book producers in the Western world. Why on earth did I tell you that story? In both my personality and my preaching style, I try to avoid being grandiose. I try to steer clear of making exag exaggerated claims. Today, I gladly break the rule. Your family, your school, your neighborhood, your workplace, your social media feeds, your friendship networks, your congregation, all the communities of which you're a part desperately, desperately need God's shalom. And I don't for one minute think that we Christians have cornered the market on peacemaking. Good grief, we have more often than not been part of the problem 
But here's the truth, friends. The broader market for peacemaking has collapsed. And the most pressing need in the world right now is for coalitions of people to band together and commit themselves to the way of peacemaking. So during Lent, we're asking you to become a monastery, not to learn bookmaking skills, but to learn peacemaking skills. The renaissance, the rebirth of a different kind of world can begin this season with us, with our small tentative steps towards this new way of life. Amen.